But they apply to an <laughs> they apply to anything else. So, just to give me an idea of Erlang experience here, who has heard of Erlang? That's a good start. Who has、um, downloaded it and played around with it? Okay, okay, there, there, that's a significant gap.、Um, that's fine, no problem at all. This is this is this is why we're giving this talk today.、Um, so, of the people who have raised their hands, how many have、uh, running software someplace or have built some applications in Erlang? Okay, a handful. Great, that's great, that's great. Okay, well, so this topic of reliability is I, I'm passionate about reliability. I think reliability is an important thing.、Um, There's a fixation with performance and speed in our industry. I think it's a fixation with performance and speed, probably in life in general, and、uh, it just shows up everywhere. So whenever you look at software, it's always about scalability, how powerful something is,、uh, how fast it is, how many things can it do concurrently. And Erlang definitely fits into this category. But I'm not going to talk about that stuff. I'm actually going to push that to the back, and I'm going to talk about the, the bread and butter reliability, things that work, and. I'm going to use this as a model. I'm going to have a story here to talk about the value of reliability. So these are two cars that I actually own. The first one is a 1982 Malibu, Chevy Malibu. The second one is a 1984 Nissan Maxima. This car up at the top was a complete maintenance nightmare.、It、cost me a fortune、uh, in money, in time, in effort, in frustration. The car on the bottom cost me almost nothing, and I had it for many, many, many years. It taught me a valuable lesson about buying cars. Just buy a reliable car. Buy something that works, because it's a lot easier.、And、in fact, during the 1980s, not just the United States, but the world just got punched in the gut by the Japanese auto, automotive、um, industry making reliable cars. They weren't that pretty. Well, neither of them are pretty, but、uh, th th this car was fantastically reliable, and it changed my buying patterns forever. Now, maybe I'm being stupid and naive. But I like Japanese cars; they're very reliable, and it, it influenced my my purchasing habits, my spending, and it purchased it influenced the spending of of millions and millions of people around the world. So it's important; it affects you know billions of dollars of industry to have things work versus not work. And this topic of speed dovetails into this. And I'm going to use Formula One. Who's a Formula One fan? Everyone should go. Come on, just France. Everyone should be a Formula One fan. So this year they changed the formula, formula radically. They introduced turbos, and they threw all the teams into a complete tizzy, because they have no one had experience running at this level of performance with a turbo. So the, the issue of reliability became first and form, for, foremost in this season. And there's a saying in motorsport: to finish first, you must first what? Finish. Yeah, you must first finish. Right? To be first, you have to actually get through the race. So I know it doesn't. You know, it's like we get up in the morning and say, "Gosh, I want to really focus on reliability." But it is so central and so important. If we're not building reliable software, reliable systems, it doesn't matter how fast we go. And I don't know. There's this. this I think it's a pretty funny video called MongoDB's Web Scale, and it focuses on this point. It makes the point that we are fixated with these numbers showing how fast things go, and we don't really care about whether things actually work. So this is the premise. This is the point. This is what I want to be talking about, and I'm going to use Erlang as a vehicle、uh, to enumerate and, and elaborate some of these different principles. Okay. So this is a funny.、Um, what is this movie? Oh, the Harry Potter. So every year, Erlang Solutions they do a different movie、uh, mock-up of the founders of Erlang, and this is one of them. So this is Harry Potter. But is, these are the founders of, 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 of the Erlang language. And to understand Erlang, we've got to go back and, and talk about its history. But the big claim to fame is the nine nines. Now, I thought nine nines is that's a pretty outrageous claim. And if you do the actual math on nine nines, it's basically no downtime. It's basically you're up forever. So I thought, well, if you're up forever, why not just say twenty six nines? I mean, why not just like like two nanoseconds of downtime every th you know three centuries? It, it's a bit outlandish, and it is in the realm of mythology. But have you heard of the nine nines mythology? Oh, well, okay. Well, so、um, it's documented that an Erlang application was was measured at nine nines availability, which is which is quite remarkable. Now, I'm not going to challenge it, but it does seem a bit far fetched. Let me just say this: there's nothing magical about Erlang. There's nothing. There's no like you turn it on and it just works. All of a sudden, my software is all reliable, nine nines, and it's never going to go down. That's not true. You have to understand how to build reliable systems. But Erlang gives you a lot of tools out of the box to help support that, and so that's what I want to talk about: history. 
Okay, so Erlang is a language created in Ericsson. And by, I'm not sure if I'm going to pronounce this correctly, Gurin Hamdal. Now, with a name like that, you know it's got to be reliable. That is just a very solid sounding name. In the 70s, you know, you had this like early industry, and, but this was really high tech stuff. At the time, it, was, it drove telephone exchanges, this architecture. And Ericsson was at the center of this. So the telephone exchange is a, an interesting computing problem because you have this thing that sits in the middle of a lot of different transactions, data and voice transmissions, all digital. And it, and it switches, it processes it, it makes decisions about where to go and how to connect. And when you have a failure in one connection, so one data transmission, voice or, or, uh, or data, uh, you can't let it propagate to the other ones. Right? You can't have a failure, a bug, or some weird transmission comes in, and then everything drops down, everything falls out. They wouldn't be able to sell a single exchange if that were the, the design. So the problem at hand drove a, re a requirement to isolate and to make reliable, to have a fault-tolerant system. It's one of the, the few sort of really, really good examples that will drive this kind of architecture. So this language, Plex, it's a language, it's like an assembly, assemb assembler. It's a pseudo-parallel, event-driven, real-time programming language. We should all have these, right? These are, these are great. Back in the 70s, um, effective, it did the job, but very expensive to use. So the problem that Ericsson had was that to find Plex developers, you couldn't, right? Nobody's learning Plex. In the 70s, it was probably assembler basic. I don't think C was C even around then. I, the early languages, certainly not Plex. So they had to bring people in and train them. That took a long time. Um, it, people would leave because this was a difficult language to work with. So they had to solve this problem. And that was going to be through a new language. And they assembled a team. This is actually kind of a skunk's work, meaning it was off on the corner, and some of the, the early founders said, let's create a new language and see what happens. Let's see if we can drive some innovation and some productivity improvements by, by replacing Plex, or trying to replace Plex, offering an alternative. And this is the spec. This is sort of the, 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 um, the qualities of the language that came out of this. OK. They knew they wanted to run on different machines. They didn't want an assembler, they didn't want an, a, a platform dependent, a, an architecture dependent machine. So it had to move around. Solaris was the primary platform. But they knew they wanted to be able to run on different machines and they wanted to be able to cross compile. They knew they needed fa massive fine grained concurrency. So if you have a, a telephone exchange, it needs to be highly, highly concurrent. You need to be able to do lots and lots of things at the same time. So when you hear Erlang as a concurrent programming language, concurrency-oriented language, it was all driven by the requirements early on in, in the history. Incidentally, this is in the 80s. This is not in the 70s. So this is, this is the evolution. Plex, Plex was created in the, in the 70s. This is Erlang, 80s. This was very interesting. No shared memory message passing. And this is probably one of the most innovative and distinctive and interesting features of Erlang. And it drives a whole bunch of features. It drives a whole bunch of qualities of the language. I sat down with Joe Armstrong. Joe Armstrong is one of the pe people featured in that poster. And he's the, the author of the language itself, the designer of the language. He co-created co Erlang, uh, but he focused on the language. And I asked him, what, what was the deal here? Why did you guys do, why did you make this decision? Because there was nothing else in the industry at that time. Everyone was doing uh, uh, thread, threading models with protection, semaphores, locks. So you would have contention on memory, and you'd have to manage that. And these guys said, forget it, we're, we're going to do message passing. And that was really the only instance, the only example um, of a language that was doing this. I said, well, how did you come to make this decision? It's so innovative, and, or so different, at least. It was controversial. He said it wasn't controversial at all. This is how things were built at Ericsson. So from the language designers, they had this heritage of things that worked very, very well from Ericsson, from this Plex you know, telephone exchange history. It's simply the way systems were engineered. And there was never a question that it was going to be mes message passing. So this is, in their estimation, how you build reliable, highly concurrent systems. And this is why Erlang looks the way it does. And you'll see how this pushes a whole set of very interesting features with respect to reliability. OK, the language itself is functional. Who here would associate, would sort of dare to associate with the functional language camp? There's two big camps. OK, one. Oh, we need more. Let me ask a question. Let me ask it again, because we need more. Who here has written any functional, like even a lisp? I'll, we'll throw a lisp in there. It, it's functional. OK, 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 all right, that's better. I feel better. Um, Haskell, um, all right, 
I won't, I won't. So anyway, I'm a functional, I've been converted from like imperative OO to functional. I'm like a, I'm like a free, I love it. It just, so maybe I'll, I'll try to evangelize some of this as I go. But the designers wanted a, a high level symbolic or declarative or functional style. You'll see different terms used to describe it early on. But it evolved eventually as a functional lang language with an emphasis on being pragmatic right, over pure. And there's a, there, in, in functional language ecosystems, you'll see this word pure, meaning we want to isolate side effects. It's kind of academic, wonky speak um, in the, the functional language camp. The Erlang camp doesn't have this point of view. It's very pragmatic. Let's just get the work done. So it's a commercial, commercially oriented language. It's not academic. And I think this is also unique, especially among functional languages, that a commercial entity drove this, this pragmatic functional language. And I think this is a big feature of the language. Not so much reliability, well, no, reliability wise. I don't talk about it though. Okay. And of course, reliability over performance. To finish first, you must, of course, first finish. So this was explicit. They said we need it to be fast enough, right? Not fast arbitrary, it has to be fast enough, but it must work first. Okay, so this, this is an American, I think this is an American joke. Did you ever see this run here, this, this ad campaign run in, in France? Has anyone seen this ad campaign? I really shouldn't put slides in here that have, have no resonance at all, I apologize. But let me explain it. I'd spent a lot of time photoshopping this caveman, so I didn't want to throw the slide out. So I'll just explain the joke. So this is a series of ads run by Geico, which is a, an insurance company. And the whole idea was it was like, insurance is so easy that a caveman can do it. And it's funny because this guy is like, he's just, a, he's human, right? He looks like a caveman. But he's like, why are you insulting me by saying cavemen are stupid? Like, why are you keep insulting me? So anyways, there's this long running series of ads. It was very funny. But Erling is so easy that a caveman can do it. So the point here, of course, is that people who are not experts in building massively concurrent systems, me, I am not an expert in this, I can pick the language up and use it. And that is really a, a, a you say concurrent meaning doing lots of things at the same time. Web applications are concurrent, systems are concurrent, things going on at the same time. Very few applications today are not concurrent. And concurrency is very difficult to do in languages that use shared memory. And this, this does not. And so it makes it easy, so easy that caveman can... This is funny. You should see the ads. I'm sure you can get them on YouTube or someplace, but... Okay, here are the principles. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through a series of principles and kind of talk about each one. And you'll note that each one can be applied to any language. So you don't have to be insecure that you're not using Erlang. Don't worry, it's fine. You can use Python, Java, C++, any language. Any language, this will all apply. And I'll give you actually some specific pointers within the, within the language ecosystems uh, that are consistent with this. Okay, so here are the principles, and I'll go into each one. So isolation, fault detection and recovery, separation of concerns, black box design, state management, and avoid complexity. Now these are mine. I did not go to like a textbook. These are just these are like from my experience. I just took them out of the air. But I do endorse them. I think that this is a pretty good list that if you sort of internalize some of these principles, you will be stepping toward and building more reliable systems. Systems that work, they're, they're cheaper to run. All the advantages of, of the, the, the automotive industry where you're spending less time with downtime in the, in the, in the shop getting things you know, fixed, spending money on reliable systems are cheaper, more leverageable systems. These principles will drive that improvement in your software. For money back guarantee. Okay, isolation. So this is very simple. It is very simple. It's very intuitive. There's no, there's no rocket science at all. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. If you have a meltdown in a, in, in a core on the, on, the, on the enterprise, you throw Spock in there right, and shut the door and let him take the radiation because he will eventually be reborn later. So you can just like send him in there and he'll take care of things. But the idea is simple. If you have a big problem, if you have a problem, you don't want it to propagate. This is the single most important idea in building a reliable system. You cannot have a fault, an error in logic or state, or corruption. You cannot have it spread. If you have it spread, you're doomed. Who here runs Windows 3.1? You, you do. That's your luck. Okay, well, so Windows 3.1 is used. No, seriously? Do you? Really? Are you kidding? Yeah, you are serious. Okay, well, maybe it's like an embedded system, like memory constrained or something. Anyway. That's great that you use Windows 3. I don't. Um, I, similarly, I don't use Windows or uh, OS 9. These are not, these are not uh, microkernel-based operating systems. 
it's very easy for a single application to take the entire operating system to its knees. Very, very easy. And applications in Windows 3.1 have to cooperate. And if you have a bad app, your operating system is done. Your whole computer is done. You have to, re you have to reboot it. And now moving on to more modern and sophisticated operating systems, you have a, you have a kernel, microkernel architecture, which is a very simple, reliable core, and it manages resources across applications. If you didn't have isolation right, ac across the applications, you couldn't run your, your software. Even on my phone, this simple phone, this is a terrible Android device, I'm rebooting it twice a day, I, I can't stand it. But at least there's some semblance of isolation, so I can in theory kill something. It's not very good, it doesn't work very well. But if it did, it would be great. Right, I could just kill off an application and the phone would work right, I wouldn't have to reboot it. But I do reboot the phone, this is isolated from yours. Right? So if I have a problem with my phone, I can just reboot it. And it doesn't affect your phones. So isolation is actually a very natural thing. We de tend not to see it in software because we don't think about this. We don't actually architect our software, typically, to isolate. But isolation is everywhere. If you have, for, for example, a fault in memory, right? one of these can actually fail. I believe the whole memory, the, the rest of the SIM will actually work. If your memory goes bad, you can pull it out and replace it. It's isolated. It, the physical world is naturally isolated. And the more you can start to think about software as being isolated, and I will talk, be specific about what I'm talking about here, the more reliable your systems will be. Okay, so that was isolation. So the point of isolation is to limit the damage. But what happens if you have damage? What happens if you have a fault? So there's two parts. You detect it, and then you recover. So let's look at failure. So obviously we have to be able to detect it. And we want to be able to det detect it quickly. So here, who here likes assertions in their code? They put assertions in. Oh, everyone should raise their hand. Assertions are great. Assertions basically say, I want the state, I believe that the state in my, in my running program right now should be this. And if it isn't, crash. Crash, just die. Because if it isn't, if you're, if you're not using assertion, say, I think x should be, x must be 5 right here. If it's not, something terrible has happened. You can pepper your code, just sprinkle your code with assertions, and you'll see crazy failures happening. It'll go crash, crash, assertion failed, boom, crash, crash, crash. What you're doing is you're detecting errors early on in the process. And that is essential to being able to recover quickly. So we want to be very aggressive, not defensive. So part of building reliable and robust systems is we need to be able to detect errors early on. And in Erlang, there's a very, there's a, there's a, there's a built-in, it's part of the culture. It says, let it crash. And you'll hear that if you go on the mailing list or read the books. Let it crash, let it crash. Don't worry about error handling. If there's a problem with the state, if there's a problem with your code, let the thing crash. Now that makes sense in the context, only in the context of isolation. Because if you can't isolate, you don't want to crash. If you can't isolate, you're defensive. You never want an error to happen. So you're very protective. You never use assertions. You never let things crash. Because if it crashes, it brings your whole system down. But if you have isolation, you can let that one component fail and the rest of the system remains running. So that is a, that's a principle of avoiding defensive measures, and, and assertions are part of that. And you can use those in any language. Obviously, limiting the scope of failures is the, uh, is the isolation principle. So this is recovery. Sorry about the reference here. This is a South Park... <laughs> so this is an episode where the internet goes down. Did anyone see this? Yeah, so it's a very funny episode. It's, it's, a little, it's a little racy, but it's very funny. At the, end of the, at the end of it, the internet was down, and it turns out there was just this huge router, and, and Stan here goes and pulls it out and plugs it back in, and he fixes it. So this is, this is the courtesy of South Park. This is the three-step process to recovering anything. Right? You unplug the internet. Right? You wait five seconds. We've done this right, a thousand times in our life, maybe more. And then we plug it back in. Right? And what, what, what happens? It works. It's magic. We do this all over the place. Laptops, access points, telephones. I had an experience in my car. Uh, I don't remember what car this was. It was a number of years ago. And the, the ABS brake light went on. I'm like, why is this on? This is crazy. I'm just driving down the highway. I'm like, I bet, I bet if I pull over, turn the car off, turn it back on again, it'll go away. And sure enough, it fixed it. I fixed my car. I'm a genius. We all fix things because they're designed to be, they're, first of all, they're isolated, but they're also designed to be recoverable through this process. 
even an F1 wing. So this, this gets into, this isn't just limited to software. Um, so in Formula One, these front wings are, are very, very important. They keep downforce in the front. And they get damaged all the time. Any little thing can, can affect the front wing. And so you need to be able to recover it quickly. Replacing an F1 wing is, costs five seconds of time at a pit stop, pit stop, roughly. About five seconds. It's that well designed to be rebooted. So turn it off, wait five seconds. I didn't even realize that was a correlation there. <laughs> I just discovered that. Plug it back in, off you go. So in your software, you want to be able to shut it down and turn it back on. And so you have to think about how do things start up. You have to think about how to, how to be able to design things, these things for recovery. OK. Incidentally, when you, I, would encourage, I would encourage everyone here to spend some, some more time with Erlang. I'm not just simply trying to evangelize the language. I believe when you start to use lang, uh, this language in particular, because it was designed with reliability in the, fo in the foreground, and the, and the community focuses on reliability, you will learn very pragmatically how to build. And you can just slip this stuff into your, to, to your other. It's a, just a nice way of learning. And it's a fun way of learning, something new. And uh, it's very applicable in general. So this is something that, over the last maybe, I don't know, three or four years, I've really started to believe in, like as a religion. Like, I've just, like this is a religion. Like, separation of concerns is probably the most valuable design principle I, could, I can think of. And the idea is very simple. You stay small and focused and independent. When you have small, focused, independent pieces, you can reason about them. Because we're building software. We're, we are controlling this stuff. And our brains have to be able to get around something. And when you separate a concern, separation of concern is just, this thing does one thing and it does it very, very well. And the one thing very, very well is something that we can get into our brain and reason about. We can communicate, we can collaborate, we can, we can if something goes wrong, we can un more easily understand what could be going wrong. It becomes easier to test because you have a narrower focus. It's a functional isolation. If you have feature creep in an application, that's effectively like allowing your features to leak out. It's, it's the opposite of isolation. So if you have a bad feature, right, it's going to affect your entire component. If you take that one feature out and make it a separate component, module, class, separate program, separate service, and it's very focused, it limits the scope of what that can do, both for good and for evil. So it's a very nice principle to manage isolation around. Okay, so that's, that's separation of concerns. And this is something, you know, like Wikipedia has a really nice article on separation of concerns, and you can go, go crazy on it. But it's a really deep area, and it applies to anything. Um, and it's, it's something that I think in a lot of languages, it, the languages don't encourage it. And uh, it's, it's, we tend, tend to overlook the importance of this principle. OK, black box design. So this is my way of saying something needs to be very easy to start. And it gets back into the fault recovery process, the, the fault recovery section. So if we look at our life today, right, telephone, computer, monitor, they're easy to use. They usually have a single button. This is a black box. That's a black box. That thing's a black. I mean, they're everywhere. Right? We don't see the internals of something. We see a very simple interface, and it's usually turn it on. Right? Boom. We can apply that to our software as well. When we start something, it's easy. Everything, there's, no, there's no complexity to it. This whole idea of, of, um, of DevOps, uh, so trying to manage your infrastructure as code, has a lot to do with this sort of being able to just turn something on. You have an appliance, and you turn it on. Boom. Comes up. And it has a very well-defined startup script, if you will, a, a way that you can always repeat this. So how do you fix something? You unplug it, you wait a few seconds, you plug it back in. That's a black box. It's difficult to do this in software if your software doesn't support this. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of applications, there's a lot of uh, languages out there that have no concept of this. Erlang does, and this is sort of why it's landing in this presentation. So this is like this application-oriented development. It's easy to st set up. Ideally, you just plug it in. Very simple, turn it on, there's one button. You just push the button. You have a minimal set of controls, and you reboot it to fix. So how would that work in, how would that work in a non-Erling environment? Erling has some very specific features to enable this and help this. We'll talk about how we can do that in, in other languages. OK, state management. This is an interesting thing, and this might be a little bit controversial. Uh, Erlang, it's been said that Erlang hates state. 
Uh, somebody wrote a, a blog post called Erl Erlang is a Ghetto, and he was, eh, it was fun, it was kind of fun. And, and, uh, but one, one of the things he said was, uh, the, the author said, was that it hates state. Erlang doesn't really hate state, it, it just dislikes state. It's not so strong a term as hate. It's difficult to work with state in Erlang. It's a pain. It's, you, know, you, you don't have the ability to just create very deeply nested. It's, it's difficult to, to do. But I found interestingly, this is, this is an advantage. These are scribes, and they're copying manuscripts. And, and the Hebrew scribes have a, a numerical system, checksum. Uh, I don't know if these are Hebrew scribes or not. It was difficult enough just to find this one image. But the Hebrew um, uh, language, the alphabet, each, each character has a number associated with it. And you can basically do a checksum on a page. So you can write the page out, you do a checksum, you add up you know, the columns in a particular direction, and then you can use that to compare it to a copy. So if the numbers match, you have a very high probability that that copy is exactly right. So it's just an illustration of the expense of state. But in building a reliable system, you have all of these things to worry about with state. Durability, if you want to store something on disk, how do you recover it? That's an expensive thing. Who here is sort of a database person? A database, ex not expert, but uses a database? Okay, excellent. Well, you know, I mean, if you have any experience with databases, they can be, you know, they're, they're tricky, especially at scale, especially when they grow, especially when they get complex. So you have these topics, durability, and, and a database is nothing more than a very, very complex piece of state management machinery. Replication is another form of, of, of creating a reliable uh, database. There's durability, there's replication. Replication leads to failover. Failover is a very, very complex topic. Um, integrity, the data integrity, how do you repair something when it becomes corrupt? When you want consistency, if you have two nodes and you're right over here and you read from here, you want that, the written value to be read, how do you deal with synchronization? All these topics are endemic to state. State is very, very complex. And so state should be managed carefully. And I think I snuck this topic in as maybe a little bit controversial. Maybe it doesn't belong here. But I just want to talk about it because I like this point. This is how I solve state. This is my first pass at solving state. This is an American footballer, um, and this is a, a, a play. Basically, when you, I don't want to explain the rules of football, basically he's giving the ball to the other, other side. He's punting it. He's just getting rid of it. Getting, this is called a punt. So we get rid of the ball, the other team gets it. So I like to punt on state. I don't like to manage state. I want somebody else to manage state. So whenever I have the opportunity to say no in my program, I, don't want, I'm, I want to build reliable systems. I'm not dealing with state. You deal with state. It's selfish. It's selfish, and it's, it's juvenile. But there are a lot of cases where it actually works, and here's one of them. This is a very famous case. This is cookie management, or state management, in a web application. <laughs> so this is, this is from Ur I'm going to give Oracle full credit for this. But this is just basically to allow like, you to know who is visiting your website and sort of track like, you know, the, the state of, let's say, a checkout process, a, a shopping cart. Like what, what is a human use doing? You know, there can be logins, whatever. Like when you go to a website and it remembers who you are, that's session management. And this is an extremely complicated process of, st of state management here. I mean, you've got back-end databases, you have replication, you have message brokers, all of this stuff, all of this complexity. It's a very good picture of how crazy state management can be. Now, if you punt, punt it, what happens? You can use, in this particular case, I'm cherry picking a simple example, but you use cookies. Cookies are a very convenient way. You can encrypt them, you can, it's like, what is it, 4K now or 2K? You can push the data out and the client manages it. So rather than doing all of this stuff on the server side, you say, punt it, too complicated. I can't, I cannot build a reliable, this is not, this is just gonna be a problem. <laughs> I mean, things are going to break all the time. There's way too much complexity here. If I can get rid of the complexity, I can build a, I can build a more reliable system. So I'm just going to use cookies. Now, I cherry-picked this, because this is a convenient example of how this works, and sometimes it doesn't work. But to push back on state, to, to, to try to create stateless systems, will make your systems more reliable. It gets into the rebooting process. Uh, this, Maybe I should pull this out, but I, I, I want you to be, here's what I want, here's what I ask of you. Next time you think about state, think in the back of your head, this is probably more expensive than I think, and is there a way to not do it? Is there a way I can simplify it? That will contribute to a reliable system. All right, that dovetails into this, complexity. 
this is kind of common sense, right? It, it's, it's, you know, separation of concerns, keep things simple, keep things focused, keep things narrow, avoid complexity. While it's a very simple thing to say, I find that in my day to work, day to day work, this is probably the number one problem that I have, both in my own development and the development of, my, of people I work with, my colleagues, is just this idea of wrangling complexity. Things tend to get out of control. They tend to, tend, tend to, to become non-obvious and very complex, and it's the, it's the easiest way to poison a system in terms of reliability, the ability to maintain, a, maintain a, a, a availability of a system. So here's some signs. Okay, dependencies. Um, Java programmers. Who's a Java programmer? Okay, gotcha. All right, good. I, 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 I don't know exactly the demographic. I knew you weren't functional. I knew it was an early. Okay, Java. Mostly Java. All right. So who, who uses Maven? Of course. How do you do anything without Maven? How do you even work with Java without Maven? I mean, when I look at Maven, I think, wow, this is a powerful, powerful tool to manage dependencies, a dependency management tool. And, and it's very, very easy in the Java ecosystem in particular to introduce a tremendous, like, incredible number of, I'm always surprised at how many dependencies are in it. I'm picking on Java kind of deliberately. I think this is a problem. I think there's too many dependencies. But this is an example of an ecosystem that has evolved to sort of be okay with dependencies. Dependencies are very, very costly. They, they create complex graphs of, 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 of dependencies, dependencies that cause all sorts of problems in terms of reliability. So if you can minimize those, get rid of your, get rid of your um, dependency management system and see, see if you can manage it. Get rid of that tool and see if you can do it. If, if it's too complex, maybe it's just too complex. Maybe you need to work on simplifying and flattening your structure. Something to keep an eye on. Nested hierarchies is a similar thing. It's a sign of complexity. Whenever you have to nest something, you have to go from a flat structure to a nested, it's just a sign. It doesn't mean it's always complex, but it's a pretty good sign. Deeply nested class hierarchies, complicated. Flat, less complicated. So it's a sign. So there's a smell of complexity. So you start to see this happening in your, in your code, and you think, well, maybe this is a little bit too complicated. Maybe we should try to flatten something and, and, and simplify, reduce the dependencies. Resource sharing is another one. This is something that I've, uh, I've recently, over the last year or so, been ch has changed my programming style. This, this idea of obviousness. When you look at something, is it immediately obvious within 10 seconds? Anything. A, a class diagram, a block of code, um, a, a class itself, just a class, uh, a program. Whatever abstraction, whatever level, high level, low level, whatever you're looking at, can you sort of divine this? Can you discern this within, let's say, 10 seconds? Or do you have to go and read documentation for an hour and reverse engineer code? Or you look at this huge block of code and say, I just I don't have no idea what's going on. Though that is a profound sign of complexity. And working to t sort of make things obvious will drive your complexity down and improve the reliability of your system. And this is my favorite one because it's like one of those inspirational things. Fear, like you have a poster on the wall. Fear is the greatest sign of complexity. Um, it really is. It's a, it's, it's a, it, it, like, have you ever seen code that you're just afraid to touch? <laughs> yeah, I've seen a lot of code that is very, very scary. And I don't want to touch it. That's a certain sign of complexity. So these are things that kind of send off odors. And you think, well, let's work, work to try to drive that complexity out. It's a principle of reliability. Simpler systems are more reliable. There we go. Okay, so I have 18 minutes left. This is, these slides will be online, and this is more technical stuff. Um, so I'm going to kind of go a little bit quickly here. Um, but these are, I've gone sort of through principles, and I want to talk about some practical steps to implement this sort of thing. Actual things that you can do, not just theory. Okay, so the, the isolation, the process isolation, is that Spock the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. The wonderful thing about operating systems, unless you're one of the few who have been using Windows 3.1, wonderful thing is that you get process isolation for free in an operating system. So a very easy way to create isolation within your application environment is to just build something for an operating system, a separate program. You can't share memory, for example. So Linux, you fire up Chrome, you fire up uh, e Emacs, right? Everyone here uses Emacs? Right, of course. I know you use Eclipse and you use, what's the other one? What's the other big one? J. What is it? J. Yeah, that's it. The ID, yeah, right. Anyway, you don't use it. Anyway, 
operating system, different programs. They don't share memory. So if one gets corrupt, you kill it. So your program can be one of those applications. You don't have to write a huge program that does all these things. You can write small programs. So a teeny little program, separated concern, or a small program that runs in the operating system, if there's a fault in that program, the operating system will take care of it. it you can't share memory. You have to communicate via message passing. So this gets into the architecture of Erlang, and this is the central premise, one of the central designs of Erlang. There's no shared memory. Processes have to communicate via message passing. And when you build an application, it could be Python, C, C Sharp, C++, C, name the language, you write it as a program for your operating system, you can only communicate through message passing. Right? So sockets or you know, uh, pipes, standard I.O. is another way of communicating. You're serializing your data and it's coming back. If there's a problem in one of those processes, you kill it off. And it doesn't affect the other ones. The service may, be, may, may not be available, but it will not corrupt the memory. It can't. So you have a process isolation guarantee. You can terminate something. If something is felt, you can absolutely kill it. So writing Java application, you have, something that's, you have, a, you have an object that is, is, is wonky. Right? You have a thread that's corrupt. How do you kill it? You can't. There's no way to do it. But if you were to write a single threaded or a minimally threaded application in Java and run it as an application, you can kill that application. So this is a process of breaking your one monolithic application or a handful of you know, one monolithic application into a bunch of smaller applications and starting to build a system of applications. And that's what you get in Erlang. And the whole point is to isolate. Corruption in one cannot affect corruption in another. Okay, so these, these are some different ways you can do it. Standard I.O. servers, 0MQ. Has anyone here heard of 0MQ? Okay, good, excellent. This is a really good library for building isolated applications because you, it gives you a little, an ability to spin up a socket and communicate via message passing very trivially. And message passing is a great way to communicate. Send a message, wait to get a response. There's all sorts of different patterns that you can use. But the point, again, just to, just to beat it to death, if that app is corrupt, if it's bad, if it's CPU is spiked, you have no idea what's going on, it's crazy, you kill it, and then restart it. Up it comes. Cool stuff. Okay. And of course, web apps. REST, REST interfaces is probably what most people would use for this, this type of thing. When you create a, a RESTful interface, this is what you're doing. You're creating an endpoint of functionality, and that can be a very simple, you know, central, you know, this separation of concerns. When you create a REST application, HTTP, it's, you know, a data-oriented API over HTTP, right? you can be as focused as you want, and if there's a problem with that, restart it, right? Reboot the phone, reboot the, the access point. Right? So if nothing else, just break your app up into a bunch of HTTP applications. You're probably running Tomcat anyway, or JBoss. Just start to, to break it up into smaller instances of Tomcat. I'm talking about operating system processes, not plugins to Tomcat. So actors, um, semantically, there's no shared memory in, in an actor model. So if you've heard of actors, it's a popular thing. It shouldn't be popular. It should just be basic. Everyone should do it. Like separated, sing, you know, single-threaded processes, whether they're properly isolated or not. The problem with these actor models in the JVM is they're not actually isolated. But you have to rely on the library. So at the end of the day, you can still get corruption in the JVM or in any VM that doesn't actually guarantee you process isolation, but this is better than, better than not using actors. So if you have access to an actor library, start to play with it, start to get familiar with it, start to read, read up on it, and you can learn what's going on with this whole actor thing that'll take you down this road. So actors use queues to process messaging. The thread communication are used. You put something in a thread or in a queue, you pull it out. It's a well-known and robust pattern for dealing with concurrency in a threaded application. And it's available to everybody. Everybody has access to, to, to these libraries. Um, here are some languages that uh, support actors directly, but you can also use libraries. All you have to do for your language is just, write actor, just Google actor library, if you don't already know what... what and, these will be available online. So, this is not a comprehensive list. Google is better. Just use Google. <laughs> this is this might be old. I don't even know what. I, I just googled this and threw it in. So, I've never used any of these. I don't endorse them. I don't know. They they just exist. That's all I'm saying. Okay. This is cool stuff. Failing fast by leaving assertions in your code. Let, let's say let's say so. There's a handful of people who use assertions. The problem with assertions 
is that people tend to compile them out for pr production. They leave them in for testing, and then they leave them out. They take them out for production systems. If you leave the assertions in and your assertion fails, your entire app crashes. But this is good because if your app is isolated, it's good. You want it to crash, and then it comes right back up. You supervise it. We'll talk about like, the next 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 thing is supervision. Uh, that death, that process death, is great because it was corrupt. You kill it off. It's like a cancer. Kill it. Radiate it. Die. You know, go. So assertions are great for that because you know that there was a fault, something unexpected happened, and so you don't want to keep running, and so you crash. So avoid these fail fast defensive practices can can work tremendously well when you're when you're operating system when you're using isolation at the operating system level. So you, um, th this is a great. I love this pattern in Java. There's tr because Java forces you to handle certain exception types. Like you have to declare them. So what people do is they'll say try catch, right? Th or e dot print stack trace and then return something. Usually no. Right? Have you ever seen a program where like you have these scrolling like stack traces prints and then you have, at the end you have a null pointer exception <laughs> because the value that came out of that mess was a null value. This is like the worst programming practice ever because it's, all you're doing is, is like being defensive. You want the thing so desperately to run that you're willing to suffer all sorts of bizarre corruption that you have no idea to reason about just because you want it to live. Don't let it live. Let it die. Let that exception go all the way to the top and let the whole operating system, let the, let the whole process die. So what does my code look like? My Java code, I literally throw exception from every function. I can't stand the exception handling. Just throw exception. Don't, you might, you might be, your, your code review process may frown upon this, but I, for me, I don't care. <laughs> throw, I throw exception and then it just, any exception happens at any point in time. It propagates all the way to the top and then the thing crashes. You log it out, write it out, and let your operating system die. Because I don't know, I, these exceptions sometimes are, are difficult to divine. You don't know, you have all this error handling code. When you can freely die, you let your pro operating system process die, you can avoid all of these defensive measures. And you can just say, I don't care. Oh, the, an error occurred, fine. It died, and then you restart it. Leave them in. Exiting the process is not a bad idea. We talked about that. So to make this stuff work, we have to be able to supervise the process. So if death is acceptable, right, this is what I'm saying. Like in a reliable system, the, the, the front wing on the F1 car, death is acceptable. It got damaged. It died. Pull it off and re rebirth it. Give it a new one. Reboot the phone. The state is corrupt. The, the state and that thing, I bet right now, is corrupt. I don't know why, but it is. I guarantee it. Today, I'll have to reboot it. Right? Let it die. Bring it back up. Requires supervision. And there's all sorts of libraries that you can use to supervise your operating system processes. So I should have them in here. I, I, I should have them in here. I don't. But op, when you build stuff at the operating system level, supervising processes, detecting when they die, and then restarting them, is very endemic. It's endemic. People do it all the time. It's how you keep systems running. And when you write your programs to be these small, focused, independent operating system processes, and you supervise them, when they die, they come back up. And it's magic, because you write a system that has faults. It has failures. Oh, fault, failure, fault, failure. But it dies, and it gets reborn again, and it starts to run. And you sleep. You don't care about the pager. The pager goes off. Ah, it's okay. I know it's restarting. So that's this step toward building reliable systems, systems that just work, systems that are cheaper to maintain. Right? You, you go faster. You'll be able to write more functionality because you don't have to write perfect code. You can write code that has faults in it. Or you can just let it crash. Okay, and it restarts. Now, maybe that's a critical bug, but maybe it isn't. And it's interesting to see when you go down this road and allow things to die aggressively but come back up, how many problems just sort of go away. It's like noise. It's like, oh, yeah, this happened. It died and it got restarted. But at the end of the day, no one noticed. No one cared. How many here have rebooted web servers, have gotten into weird situations? Everybody has. Come on, everybody has. Or haven't you? Or just rebooted anything. If, you're, if you write code that does that automatically, and all of it's like small, inconsequential, like you've got all these things dying and coming back, your system is very, very robust. And you can do this in any language. Erlang happens to be excellent at this. Very, very good. So use Erlang, but you can also use any, anything. Okay, we've talked about small appliance um, 
oriented development, micro SOA, all of these things contribute to this idea. So small focused services that are isolated that can, be, that can be shut down and brought back up. This is my little plug for functional style programming. Um, if you have an opportunity, I would in really encourage you to try a functional language. And I would, I would recommend Erlang because it's very pragmatic. There's not a lot of overhead. It's a very simple language. Very, very easy language to get started using a functional. And just learn another language. Learn, learn a very different way of thinking about programming in, in certain areas. Uh, Erlang's very good for that. Okay. So I want to make sure I have some time for a Q&A here. Um, so this is, we're almost done here. So invest in simplicity. Again, that's the... It's the rowing, like you've got the rowing team, invest in simplicity, you've got the poster on the wall, invest in simplicity. It's right, it's true, should. Okay. Um, let me make one point here before, I, before we get into the talking bear and in conclusion. Um, this whole thing about avoiding... Uh, yeah, this is worth it. I'm going I'm to take one minute to do this. This is good. Standard of obviousness for me is very important. It has become important. It's very difficult to write programs that are obvious. And the process of making something obvious is incredibly productive, valuable work. It forces you into simplicity, it forces you into focus, it forces you into understanding. When you can understand something and you can communicate it to your colleagues, that thing is going to be better quality. It's going to be more reliable. You're going to be able to fix it more quickly. You're going to be able to iterate and improve it more quickly. So. This leads into this sort of incremental, very simple, always doing the next thing that's obvious. It's clearly you, you have an ev evolutionary approach. And avoid speculation. If you have separation of concerns and you're focused on things narrowly, you tend not to build speculatively. You tend not to add a bunch of things that can later potentially undermine the reliability of a system. So kind of philosophy here to, to finish things off. Okay. With that, I have five minutes for Q&A and Talking Bear. MongoDB, so was the reference to MongoDB, have you seen this? MongoDB is web scale, the, the video, the Talking Bear video. You should watch it, it's funny. Yeah. Okay, any questions? Yeah. I'll repeat it. So, sorry? I'll, I'll repeat his question. <laughs> okay. I'll drink some water. Hello. Uh, what about the higher cost of microservices? Since you tend to prefer to, I would say, split all the services in separate process? It, it, it's a cost. And, it, interestingly enough, we've just had this conversation on the Erlang mailing list about how to manage a, a complex project. Um, and there's two schools of thought. One is to put it into one container, sort of wrapper, because it's easy. And then there's another school of thought that says, break it into small components that are all like sort of express their own dependencies independently. And there's a trade-off there. So, the, so, so, you know, investing in this sort of separation of concerns and micro or uh, SOA, service-oriented architecture, there's a cost to that. But there's also a benefit. And I think it's important to keep an eye on that. There's a certain common sense that you want to apply. You don't want to go crazy. You don't want to just make this a religion where you break everything up where it doesn't make sense. So I think maybe look at things perhaps in terms of stability of code, maybe a core thing that works all the time, and you're, it, can, it can get bigger. It doesn't change much. It can get big. But something that's new and maybe untested, make that small. So that's an idea to try to maybe have a happy medium where you can have a monolithic app that doesn't really need to be rebooted that much because it's stable. But then you introduce new features by way of small isolated components. Have, bo have, a, have, a, have both, both sides of, of the model working. Always use common sense. Other questions? Yeah. Oh. Hello. Yeah. Uh, you said earlier that um, uh, you opposed uh, Erling and uh, object-oriented uh, programming. But uh, for me, uh, one of the, of the main principles of uh, object-oriented is uh, the encapsulations of data, which I see as the same thing as isolation. So, so, so I would say the difference there is that the object-oriented model encapsulates the state or the logic of your program, whereas what I'm talking about with isolation is a runtime feature. So it is like physics, it's like electrons. So this, the objects can, could potentially be implemented through a shared nothing message passing approach. Smalltalk kind of went down that road. 
Um, Java certainly doesn't. Um, you can get, get to anything in the heap th through Java. What I'm talking about is the physics of it, the actual runtime operational side. And unless that's isolated, you just don't have isolation. It doesn't matter how logically isolated your code is. Um, so I definitely agree that objects give you the ability to think in terms of isolation, but it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's the pre-compiled, it's how to manage your code and the design of your code, as opposed to the runtime qualities of your code. Time for one more question. I insist. Somebody ask a question, please. I have a, I have a minute left. What are we going to do? Play cards? Okay, thank you very much.